Welcome back to World History 2. I hope you're all doing well today. In today's lecture, we'll be looking at the Second World War, Part 5. Stay tuned for the PowerPoint. Okay, class, we're going to have the PowerPoint for the Second World War, uh, Part 5. Okay, so we're going to just back up a little bit in the timeline that we've been talking about with uh, the Second World War. And uh, Hitler had invaded Poland in September of 1939, uh, but did not... Uh, invade France until uh, the spring of the next year. And during that time, September 1939 to April 1940, was this eight-month long time period from the time the Germans invaded Poland until the invasion of France. And this time period was called the Phony War because nothing really happened in the West except that, that little um, uh, event that France did in the Saar region where they kind of invaded the Tsar and then backed out and then nothing else really happened. And what was happening really was the Allies were attempting to get their forces up and going uh, to be able to uh, take the war to Hitler. Uh, but also Hitler was having to re-strategize uh, after uh, taking Poland and then having to move his military to uh, the other side of Germany for the invasion of France. So uh, it's called the Phony War. It's also called the Sitzkrieg, which is uh, kind of a, a funny take on Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg meaning lightning war. Well, Sitzkrieg actually means sitting war. So not much was going on. Uh, the British and the French had declared war on Hitler, but uh, Hitler was focused on Poland. Uh, now, one of the things that we do have to look at, uh, well, not in detail, but just to bring up, is that uh, during the Phony War, and, and actually all the way till the end of World War II, uh, there were these resistance operations that were taking place in the occupied lands that Nazi Germany had occupied. And really what they were were um, resistance groups who did underground actions. They acted in a variety of ways. Uh, during the, the phony war, it was more like non-cooperation. They did propaganda things. Uh, sometimes they were bold with assassinations of maybe Nazi leaders in France uh, that uh, were... Um, not involved in military operations. Uh, but later on, after the invasion of France, until the end of the war, the resistance became very elaborate uh, and active. So you had units that were doing whole-scale fighting against the Germans. Um, sometimes pilots would be uh, shot down over occupied land, and the resistance would get them back to England, uh, kind of like... Uh, an underground railroad type idea where they had safe houses and different ways to move people and actually get them out of the country. Uh, sometimes they even recapture entire villages. So there are these resistance operations that went on. Uh, on the screen there you see some French resistance fighters. Uh, they are men and women, uh, you know, dressed in plain clothes and they would do um, resistance activities. In fact, it got uh, very, uh, very involved especially with the Germans fighting the resistance, that the Germans have this uh, badge on the, on the right-hand side. It's the German anti-partisan badge. That's supposed to say anti right here. I forgot the I. The German anti-partisan badge. And this was awarded to a German that fought for over 50 days against the resistance. And so um, they, it got very involved, the, taking the fight to the resistance and the resistance fighting the Germans. Okay, so as uh, things progressed, uh, the United States and Great Britain got together and they developed this Germany first principle. And just in a nutshell, uh, relations with Japan had uh, really deteriorated uh, before Pearl Harbor. And the United States was kind of looking at, they, they are probably gonna end up entering the war sometime. And so who would they uh, fight first? And so the idea was, to um, to take out Germany first, and that became the, uh, known as the Germany first principle. So let's just run down through this slide quick. The United States had been helping Great Britain with non-war and war materials through the Lend-Lease program, and that had been going on for about two years. But by December 1941, the British and the Russians were having a very difficult time with the German forces. Uh, basically, Great Britain was alone, and Russia was being pushed back. So they were really kind of hurting. Well, the U.S. And, the, and Great Britain met at the ABC One conference and promised that if the United States entered the war, the U.S. would focus on fighting Germany first, since the relations with Japan had fractured and intelligence believed that war would, with Japan was going to come anyway. 
Now, J uh, Churchill was actually leery about this because he did not want a second front with Germany just yet. He would rather have them uh, have the Germans be fighting in uh, in Russia and let the Germans basically let let there be a bloodletting in Russia. You know, so more German soldiers are killed there than in some second front if the Allies would invade France right away. And so really it was kind of pushed off, and that's why instead of invading Europe in 1943, uh, the Americans invaded Africa in 1943. Although the U.S. had fought Japan since 1942, so if you remember Pearl Harbor was December 7, 1941, and it took some time to get the, the Marines up and going and the Navy up and going, well, finally in 1942 there's been some more action going on in the Pacific, the vast majority of the U.S. war planning and material was focused on getting to Africa and getting to Europe. So you see there on the screen, Africa was 1943 and Europe was 1944. Now, the war in the Pacific had been going on since 1941, end of 41, getting up and going into 42. But And even though there was a lot of action over there, it was basically the Marines and uh, a couple of carrier groups that were taking the war to Japan. And it was a lot of soldiers, a lot of Marines, a lot of Navy personnel, a lot of ships. I'm not trying to minimize it in any way. It was a, it was a big action in the Pacific. But the focal point for the U.S. training of, of soldiers and creation of uh, um, factories that would make war material or converting factories over to war material, it was all for basically getting the war to Europe. So there was, you know, uh, tanks being made, airplanes being made, jeeps being made, all of that for for warfare in Europe, not not jungle warfare on islands in uh, in in the Pacific. So the whole focus was Germany first. Uh, the U.S. was eager to destroy Germany, who was the principal nation in the Axis powers and then focus on Japan. And we got to remember that also is that Germany was really the powerhouse and the leading nation in the Axis. It wasn't Italy and Japan was powerful in their own right in the Pacific, but they weren't really taking war to, to Russia or to um, any, anything in Europe. So the, the German focus was always in the forefront of American thinking. Uh, however, the fighting in the Pacific was long and drawn out, Marines and Navy uh, ended only several months after the fall of Germany. So it's not like the war in Germany would have ended quickly, uh, war with Germany would have ended quickly, and then they would have taken this like long, prolonged war against Japan. Really what happened was Germany fell, and it was just a few months later Japan fell. So this whole Germany first principle, it was just kind of kind of out of, out of kilter a little bit uh, because Japan fell soon after anyway. Okay, so the Western Front, we're going to talk about the rest of this PowerPoint uh, about the war in Europe. Uh, the Western Front, which consisted of these, these nations, Denmark, Norway, Luxembourg, Belgium, Netherlands, Great Britain, France, Italy, and Germany. Uh, that, these, these were the fronts uh, that basically had to be cleared of Germans, uh, well, minus Great Britain, but uh, cleared of Germans uh, to basically win the war on this Western Front. Uh, but the Allies did not want a repeat of World War I Western Front, which was that trench warfare, the trench stalemate, four years of basically fighting and getting nowhere. Uh, they did not want that at all. And so they had to have a different kind of approach uh, to this. Now, it was a different strategy because um, Germany had taken all of France. They occupied northern France, and Vichy France was in the south. And they what they did was they fortified... Uh, the northern coast of France and the other countries, uh, they had basically made this like Atlantic Wall. That's what it's called. Is there's this fortification system across the across the coast. Uh, here's a picture of it. It's called the Atlantic Wall. The yellow line is basically uh, the fortification line that Germany had set up, and it was very elaborate, uh, especially uh, right in this area here. Um, obviously, they would be thinking that if an invasion is going to come, it's going to be coming from a staging point in England, which they were correct. The Germans were correct in believing that. They just didn't know where it was going to be. So they really fortified this. I mean, it's a long area, and it's, it was heavily fortified. 
Okay, so the invasion of Europe, um, called Operation Overlord, was the code name for the invasion of France uh, at Normandy. You probably heard of that name before, Operation Overlord. It's also called D-Day, uh, June 6th, 1944. Uh, the actual landings on the beaches had its own code name. That was called Operation Neptune, the actual landings itself. But Overlord was the code name for the, the taking of of uh, France or getting a foothold into France. It was the largest air, sea, and land invasion in history. And the goal was to surprise Germany. Um, Germany figured the invasion would be coming uh, either f an attack into Normandy or an attack into Calais, uh, which was closer to England. Calais is actually very close to England, uh, but um, and Normandy is further away. It's just that Normandy had better air cover, so the airplanes coming from England had more uh, opportunity to give air cover over Normandy than over Calais. Uh, there were also elaborate deception plans used by the Allies to fool the Germans. Uh, there was, and we don't have time for this uh, study, but there was a, a, a fake army developed, didn't even exist, and it was supposedly staged on the English side across from Calais. And so the Germans thought that there was an army actually massing there. Uh, it didn't exist. It was just lies that they put over the radio that they allowed to have it be intercepted by the Germans. And the Germans believed that there was a large army there. There's, there's pictures. There. They, had, they had like blow up tanks. Uh, like kind of made out of like a big balloons. Um, they had fake cannons made out of telephone poles and and wagons and all that. It was so if if there was reconnaissance by the Germans from the air, they could see something there, but it wasn't a real army at all. The entire time, the forces were being gathered all over southern England for the invasion of France. Um, D-Day. Okay, so what does the D and D-Day stand for? Um, a lot of people have different ideas about it, like uh, Decision Day, Doomsday, uh, that kind of a thing. Uh, but really, D-Day, um, all it means is the day a military operation is, is beginning in an area. And there are many D-Days. Uh, all, that's all it means is the day something starts in the military, like an invasion. Uh, but uh, really, the D and D-Day stands for day. So it's, it kind of is like day-day. Um, it's kind of like if you said H hour. Uh, you know, what time are we going to start? We're going to start at H hour. H hour just means the hour that you're going to start, but it's called H hour. Uh, D-Day is the same way. It's just the day that you're going to start. And so June 6, 1944 is D-Day. We don't have time to get into the background details of this either, but there was a whole deal with um, it was supposed to start the day before, and there was bad weather, and they had to push it off. And, and if they pushed it off too much, then um, the Germans would be aware of what's going on because they basically uh, put all the, all the forces in southern England on like a 24-hour notice. And... Um, and there's other things that like the Germans, the Germans were uh, some of the main leaders, uh, generals in France. They were on leave and they were back in Germany. So there's all kinds of things that take place in the background that we don't have time to get into. Uh, but uh, just the basics, we, uh, we see the plan. Uh, the plan is to open a second front on the German forces. The first front that they're on is the Eastern Front fighting Russia. Uh, now this is going to open that second front against the Germans. The plan is to take key positions in Normandy, France, by early um, by early morning paratroop invasion, followed by a seaborne army beach landings. So the paratroops are going to drop early in the morning and capture crossroads, capture bridges, uh, capture specific areas, and then the seaborne army is going to land and move in and be able to take Normandy. It was scheduled for six Allied divisions that would invade, followed by three fresh divisions that would come. As soon as the, the way was open, three fresh divisions would come flying into France and really get a good foothold. And then they'd be able to consolidate that and then move inland. Uh, here's a map of Overlord. Um, these are the these are the seaborne operations on D-Day. You probably will have pictures coming up, but you might remember like the, the soldiers in the little boats and they come up and they storm the beach. Okay, so that's their, that's the the path that they that they take, and these are the beaches here, and then this is the airborne 
Uh, they're going to come in and parachute in and, and capture key specific areas here, and then that way that um, the forces could have a foothold here in Normandy. This is Normandy, what I'm circling here with my cursor. Um, so this is Normandy. So that's where the, the invasion is going to be. But remember what I said about Calais. Calais is up here, this little circle. That's Calais. And notice how close it is. It's really close. Uh, but the majority of the airfields are over here. And so they could have better cover, air cover, and air supremacy uh, over Normandy. So uh, this, is, this is the invasion right in here. Okay, landing beaches. Uh, you do need to know the beaches uh, for the exam. The U.S. beaches in the western part of the landing was the Utah and Omaha. Uh, Great Britain had a middle beach, uh, which was called Gold. Uh, the Canadians then had a middle beach called Juno, and then the Great Britain uh, and Great Britain had the far eastern side of the landing uh, called Sword Beach. And uh, the Great Brit Great Britain and Canadian beaches, Gold, Juno, and Sword, they did have opposition. Uh, but not as much as the U.S. with Utah and Omaha. They, those were definitely the two beaches that had a lot of German opposition. Uh, so opening moves, um, June 6, 1944, 138 ships opened a naval bombardment along the French coast. So that's a lot of ships just opening fire on the French coast. Uh, 1,000 British bombers bombed key areas in France, and that was immediately followed by 1,000 U.S. bombers. And... Basically, they just did a rotation uh, while the U.S. bombers were bombing. The British were getting reloaded, refueled, and they'd take off. And then the U.S. would come back, reload, refuel. And they just did this circling kind of bombing runs. And on June 6th alone, over 18,000 trips um, were taken. They're called sorties. A sortie is one plane that would go on its mission. And uh, they just continue in a rotation, just bombing and bombing and bombing all day long. Uh, the airborne drops in the early morning hours uh, occurred on June 6th, and that would be uh, 82nd Airborne, 101st Airborne. Uh, those were the divisions that uh, dropped into uh, Normandy. So you see the uh, map here of the up-close uh, beaches. Uh, so you have Utah over here, and then Omaha, Gold, Judo, and Sword. Uh, you have the 6th Airborne Division, which is British, over here. I'm not sure why... The 101st is not on this map, uh, but they were definitely involved in uh, the landings here around Carenton. They were involved. But you see the D-Day objective. The, so the first day, this was the objective, was to take up to this red line, uh, but that, that did not happen. Uh, they did not get to that red line the first day. There was a lot of problems. So the invasion, airborne drops were scattered all over Normandy. And they missed most of their objectives because of anti-aircraft fire. Uh, planes being shot down with paratroopers in them. Uh, planes being uh, diverted because a lot of flak hitting them. And they, they, the pilots would go one way and then go another and go another. And next thing you know, they're off course. Uh, there were navigational issues. And then they were also supposed to have radio silence. And so if you can't talk to one another, you might miss your drop zones. Uh, so... They did. They missed drop zones. They got scattered all over Normandy. As the paratroopers were trying to make sense of what was going on, so after they landed and they're trying to make sense, uh, the beach landings began. And those beach landings early morning of June 6th, they had their own confusion because vast amount of firepower the Germans were throwing uh, at the landing forces. So it was much slower than they anticipated. Uh, the early stages of the landings, most of the soldiers actually just got pinned down on the beach. They really couldn't get up out of the beach area until later on in the day, which basically just held everything up. But having said all of that, uh, the Allies, they were able to adapt to the battlefield conditions, and they did obtain uh, some of the objectives on the first day. They didn't get anywhere near that red line, that red line here. Uh, but they did take the beaches. Some of them they moved up into the land a little bit, uh, but they, you know they didn't they didn't take they didn't take the city of Khan on the first day. So at the end of the first day on June sixth, at the end of that day, the airborne were still all scattered around, and and uh, the forces kind of made their way just just a little bit inland.
Uh, so here's some pictures. This is the Airborne Forces. So this is uh, Eisenhower actually talking to them. I believe this picture was taken on June 5th because they're getting ready to load the planes and then they would take off in the middle of the night and then and then jump out early morning on the 6th. But you can see they're they're happy. They're going. Uh, this picture here of them dropping that this was probably taken during Operation Market Garden. Uh, that's, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Operation Market Garden was another parachute drop that happened during the daytime so that you could take a picture. The, the D-Day dropping, that happened in the middle of the night. It was still dark out when they jumped. Here's the beach landings. Again, you're probably very familiar with these uh, images. Here's the, the boats going up, the landing craft, landing craft, the soldiers coming out. Uh, here's some being rescued. Uh, here's a, a beach... Uh, after the battle, I mean, this is—they're clearly this is after the battle, because their soldiers wouldn't be standing up and all that if the Germans were still were still firing on them. Uh, this is a very rare photograph. There's only a few photographs that actually exist of the uh, landing itself, where the photographer was in the water and on the beach itself, uh, because of the water and the damage to the cameras. And again, this is 1944, so the camera equipment wasn't the modern stuff that we have now. Uh, but this is a photograph that survived. You can see the obstacles that are in the water. They're soldiers. So just one of those rare photographs that exist. Okay, moving inland, um, once they got their foothold in, you know, just off of the beach, uh, they were able to move in, and when you move inland, you begin to um, see the land is is farm country as they moved in the forces then faced a new obstacle and it was called the hedgerows uh, they were plagued by hedgerows and what that is a hedgerow was a quote-unquote cultivated boundary of a farm field that was tall and thick and so basically what they did in france was when you remove your rocks and you plow your dirt and, and all that to plant your field you push that all to the edge of your fields well instead of using fences like just a, a big clear area and you put fences up for your field they actually used that area where they put the rocks and put the dirt and put all that they used that area um, to you as, as separators for their fields and these areas uh, were quite tall and very thick over the years and years and years and years uh, a lot of plants trees brush hedges all that it would all grow up weeds thicket would all grow up and and make a very thick wall around your field well that's what the the u.s soldiers had to fight through and basically what happened was the germans took advantage of that and were almost fighting field to field uh, like every field was a new a new obstacle and behind the hedgerow was the germans and so they would take that they would fight and fight and fight and take that hedgerow and now they have to go across the field again and attack the next hedgerow. And uh, it was just very, very uh, difficult moving. Uh, some objectives that were taken. June 26th, Cher Cherbourg uh, was captured by the Allies. July 21st, Khan was captured. I'm just going to go back to that map. Okay, so here's Khan. That was the objective on June 6th. And it wasn't taken until July. Uh, July 21st, Khan was captured. Uh, just a little side note. Um, actually, I should have put that up here. Um, these two asterisks, just, just a side note. On July 20th, 1944, there was an assassination attempt on Hitler uh, by Germans themselves. It was called the July 20th Plot. And uh, that's where uh, a bomb exploded uh, where Hitler was in a meeting room where Hitler was. And he, uh, he had some slight injuries. There were some other people killed in the room, but he had some slight injuries. So again... Um, he survived, and he was able to continue the war for almost another year. Uh, you know what would have happened if he if he was killed? Uh, if you want to watch a movie about that, there's a movie called Valkyrie uh, with Tom Cruise. Uh, that that is the story of the July 20th plot. Uh, August 25th, uh, Paris was captured. Okay, so they they finally were able to move further inland, and they were able to take Paris on August 25th. Uh, here's a picture of the hedgerows that I mentioned. So you can see them. These are tall boundaries of the fields. And so if you take one field, then you have another hedgerow to face. And if you have to do that across all this countryside, it can be very dangerous. So you can see soldiers here next to the hedgerows. You know, so obviously on the other side of the hedgerow is German forces or maybe across that field. Okay, so the, the Allies were moving across France. 
in uh, June, July, and August. And then in September, uh, there was another front opened, um, and it was called Operation Market Garden, September 17th to 25th, 1944. Now, this was a failed invasion by the Allies of the Netherlands, and it was an attempt to push into Germany from the north. And the plan was, it was planned and led by Field Marshal General Bernard Montgomery. Remember, we had him, we talked about him in North Africa. Well, he devised this plan, and he had strong support by Churchill and Roosevelt. And the plan was, if they invade the Netherlands, if they could push the uh, Germans out of the Netherlands, that, that is a, basically a really easy way into northern Germany. So they were thinking that they could enter Germany in September if this Operation Market Garden was successful. Unfortunately, it was not successful. Uh, Market was the airborne operation to capture key roads and bridges. And then Garden, where the ground troops, basically uh, tanks and things like that, they would come in and exploit that moving into uh, northern Germany. Um, unfortunately, they weren't able to do that. The, you know, the airborne troops were not able to capture all of the crossroads and bridges they needed to. There were a few bridges that they did capture, some key ones, like the bridge at Nijmegen. But unfortunately, they just couldn't, uh, couldn't exploit it enough, and they were, end- they, they were stopped and ended up having to abandon uh, this, this effort, uh, Operation Market Guard. It ended on September 25th. Uh, they, they were able to liberate Eindhoven and Nijmegen for a time, but unfortunately that failed and they couldn't get into Germany, so they ended up uh, backing off and kind of solidifying their front. And then what they did was the U.S. and the British, they handed the front over to the Canadians so that the British and the, the U.S. could then redeploy into France to continue the attack against Germany in France. The Canadians would sit there until basically February 1945 when Germany, well, the front against Germany was kind of pushed back enough that then they could attack and join in on, uh, on the push against Germany. So really, Operation Market Garden from September 25th to February 1945, it basically was just the Canadians holding that area. Uh, here's Allies parachuting in Operation Market Garden. It's a blurry picture, kind of pixely. Uh, but this was a German photo of the airborne landing. Uh, there's de- there's accounts of the uh, paratroopers coming in like on their parachutes, and the Germans are like shooting at them as they're hanging from their parachutes coming down. And the Germans are like trying to take target practice and and uh, and shoot the paratroopers who were very vulnerable hanging there on their parachutes as they floated down. Okay, so uh, as the the forces continue to push towards Germany. Uh, we now get to December, and Hitler has to make a decision because they're getting close. The the Allied forces are getting close to the German border, and so Hitler makes a kind of a last ditch effort to punch a hole through the front. And what they what he was trying to do was punch a hole through the front, and then he would swing north and kind of divide the forces. The northern force would be smaller, easily taken. And then that would do a, a big blow to the Allies. So he attempted to split the U.S. Allied front that was moving to the German border. Uh, he, Hitler used a huge thrust of German forces of 250,000 soldiers. And again, at this time in the war, that's a lot of soldiers. And basically what his plan was was to again go through the Ardennes, the forest, because once again, the other side of the Ardennes is lightly guarded by the Allies. They did not have a lot of forces there on the Ardennes, and that's that big forest in Germany. And um, next thing you know, the German forces move through the Ardennes, and they catch the Americans by surprise. They were able to push through this lightly guarded area and create a big bulge in the U.S. front. The city of Bastogne was uh, surrounded, and that was actually held by the 101st Airborne Division, who would never surrender. They 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 did not surrender the city. They remained surrounded until they were uh, liberated by Patton. Uh, There was strong U.S. fighting during the Battle of Bulge. It was very violent, very deadly. Um, General U.S. Patton led a force uh, into the Ardennes and um, led a force in and uh, relieved Bastogne. But then he continued on into the Ardennes forest and um, 
basically German fuel and material shortages caused the Germans to withdraw. They, they did get some uh, ground, the Germans did get some ground, but they couldn't hold it because they were running out of material, they were running out of men, they were running out of fuel, and so they had to pull back. There were over 100,000 U.S. casualties, killed, wounded, or missing. It was a very uh, costly battle for the United States. So on the screen is a map of the Battle of the Bulge. So this is the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge. The green is the, is the Germans. The pink are the Allies. And so the plan was that this front would push forward and then continue up like this and then basically surround the allies here and, and vanquish them and then they'd be able to swing down and bring the fight this way also and again this was lightly guarded so that was that was Hitler's plan he didn't get very far he only got into about here okay where this cursor is moving back and forth and that is right here on the bigger map and so you see, the reason it's called the Battle of the Bulge is because you have this big bulge in the, in the American forces. So these are all the American forces. Uh, this is the Ardennes Forest right here. And here's Bastogne. So it's surrounded. That red line means that the Germans have surrounded it. And that's the 101st Airborne. They hold, uh, they hold Bastogne. But it didn't work. The um, Germans ran out of material and fuel, and they ended up being pushed back. Some pictures of the Battle of Bulge. Here's a German soldier, war-weary. Uh, here's U.S. POWs. Some more people surrender, U.S. surrendering to the Germans. So um, the Battle of the Bulge, they did, uh, it took the Americans by surprise, and people, uh, Americans were captured. But then they fought back, and again, we're talking December into January, so you have snow, this is in the Ardennes. Here's Bastogne. Uh, first in Bastogne. So this was Patton coming to rescue Bastogne, which he did. The 101st Airborne had always said that they never needed rescuing. Okay, so the fall of Germany. Uh, Russian forces from the east and the U.S. British forces from the west were sandwiching the Germans into a confined area. So they basically they were moving in on, the, on Germany on the, on the left and on the right. And what happened was it begins this race to Berlin. The U.S. British, they wanted to get to Berlin first to basically be the victors and, and call the shots. The Russians wanted to get to Berlin first so they could be the victors and call the shots. February to March 1945, the U.S. captured 280,000 Germans uh, in the western part of Germany. Uh, but even though they had those... Um, successes and and winning battles and capturing soldiers uh, the Russians were the ones that got to Berlin first and the Russians fought heavily against the Germans in the streets of Berlin and basically destroyed almost the entire city was destroyed April 16th to May 2nd is the Battle of Berlin with heavy fighting in the streets uh, they fought re the remaining military forces that existed, and okay, now you have military divisions or companies, battalions, all of that. They're they're depleted in in manpower. A lot of people are deserting and surrendering, um, especially in uh, in the West. Soldiers were leaving Berlin, traveling west, and giving themselves up to the Americans because they knew that if they got captured by the Russians, they'd be sent to the Gulag in Siberia. So people were de uh, German soldiers were deserting to the west. The Battle of Berlin was heavy fighting, and so the German forces that remained began to push the Volkssturm, which were, was an army of old men, and the Hitler Youth, which we talked about before, the Hitler Youth, they were pushed into service, and so this was a last-ditch effort to try to stop the, uh, to try to stop the Russians. Uh, again, another side note, April 28th, uh, Mussolini is killed in Italy, which we'll see that on the next slide. April 30th, Hitler kills himself with Eva Braun, who he married, um, and they killed themselves in a bunker under Berlin, and then supposedly uh, the bodies were taken outside of the bunker, um, torched with, uh, uh, with diesel fuel and 
and let lit on fire, and then there was no nothing left. You know, people have been researching to find out where Hitler is. Uh, you know, did he escape to Argentina, and he wasn't killed? Um, you know, what, were his bones taken back to Russia, and they're in some Moscow vault somewhere? Uh, there's all kinds of ideas out there. Um, I believe that Hitler and Eva Braun killed themselves in the bunker, and their bodies were torched. And I don't know what happened to the bones. Frankly, I don't care. Uh, but I don't think he survived the war. I think he killed himself. Also, um, Joseph Goebbels, if you remember him, he was the propaganda minister, that, that shrimpy little mouse-looking guy. Um, he actually had a, quite a large family. He had, uh, I think he had seven children um, with his wife, Magda. And these children were, um, they were all like the perfect German child with blonde hair, blue eyes. Um, and they ended up poisoning all of their children in the bunker, killing them all. May 8th, 1945 is the fall of Germany and the war in Europe ends. Here's a map of, of the sandwiching of the forces, the German forces that I talked about. So you have the U.S. forces here on the left, which is the west. And you have these yellow forces here. That's the Russians on the east. And they are moving across Germany, trying to get to Berlin. And the Russians are the ones that actually get to Berlin and surround it. And then they end up meeting up with the U.S. forces. And at this time, they were, you know, the U.S. and the Russians have good relations. It's not until the Cold War that the relations with the U.S. and Russia um, deteriorate. Okay, so here's the Battle of Berlin. We have Russian soldiers rushing across the street. There's a dead German. There's a Russian soldier putting the flag out. Uh, this is uh, this is on the Reichstag building. Here's the Brandenburg Gate, a very famous architectural feature in Berlin. It's still there today. Uh, so you can see all the damage that there is. Here's a Russian soldier walking past another dead German. Damage all over the streets. I mean, the, the city was destroyed. Uh, here's Hitler uh, congratulating uh, some Hitler youth. In the very last days of the war, this is the Volkssturm. These are the old men that were um, pushed into service to fight against the Russians. Probably most of them were killed. This is the last known photograph of Hitler that exists. And this is him in the ruins of the, uh, the Reichstag building. So that's him in his overcoat. Uh, after this picture was taken, he went into the bunker and he never returned out of the bunker. Well, unless he was dead. They took the dead body out. And then here's a picture of the some of the Goebel children. The picture, um, actually there's another child over here, uh, of the children who were poisoned by Joseph and Magda Goebbels before they killed themselves. So they, they killed all their children. Okay, so the uh, slide that I said was coming up. Whatever happened to uh, Benito Mussolini? Uh, April 28th Mussolini of 1945, uh, Mussolini was killed in Italy. Uh, with the U.S. and British forces moving into northern Italy, Mussolini's support basically evaporated. And I didn't get a chance to talk about the forces moving through Italy. Uh, that's another great study where they move up the boot. There's a very famous battle called the Battle of Monte Cassino, which was a monastery on top of a mountain, and a very famous battle there. The U.S. forces took Rome um, and moved forward, all the way up into the northern part, the mountainous part of Italy. In fact, I was in when I was in the Army, I was in the 10th Mountain Division uh, based in New York when I was in the infantry, and um, the history of the 10th Mountain Division goes all the way back to uh, this campaign in, in Italy where the 10th Mountain Division uh, fought in the mountains and valleys of uh, northern Italy. So basically what happens is uh, he loses his support and Mussolini and his mistress Clara, um, they attempted to flee to Switzerland, uh, but they were captured by rebels. Uh, Mussolini and Clara and the rest of the group that were with them are executed. They're shot in the head and killed. And then their corpses were taken to an Esso gas station, which, if you don't know anything about the gas stations, uh, Exxon owns Esso. And so it's kind of an interesting connection. You can go down the street here into the Exxon gas station. Well, the Exxon Corporation owns Esso. They owned them back then. And uh, uh, Esso 
gas station um, was the place where they decided to string up uh, Mussolini, his mistress, and the other people that were killed. And so in this picture on the right-hand side, you see Mussolini and his mistress Clara. They're hanging there. I, I have the arrows pointing to them. So Mussolini, who um, caused a lot of problems in North Africa, he ruled as dictator in Italy, um, was a good friend or a good ally, I should say, of Hitler. Uh, he ends up hanging upside down April 28th from a gas station dead. And uh, two days later, Hitler and his wife, Eva Braun, would kill themselves. Okay, so here's some pictures. We see um, Nazis surrender. The European war comes to an end. Uh, here they're signing articles of surrender here. Uh, here's some German soldiers surrendering. And that's going to be it for this PowerPoint. I'll see you in a second. All right, class, that's it for today. Next time, we're going to conclude our look at the Second World War. We'll be looking at Second World War Part 6. I'll see you then.